Ladies and gentlemen, you may not realise it, but we're in the midst of an epidemic. It's spreading around the planet and we're all in danger of catching it. It's caused, called the positivity virus and I believe it has the potential to cause major damage. We're being flooded by positive thinking. In fact, if you Google, just in Google images, the words be positive, in less than two sec 0.2 seconds, you're going to get two billion hits. That's just images, not books, audios, videos, all the other things that you can see, just images. It's like we're in a situation where everybody's talking about it and, in fact, everybody's even singing about it. Whether you listen to the Dave Clark Five or the Pet Shop Boys or even Bon Jovi, they're all singing about feeling glad all over. Sorry. And we're um, being pressed to be happy all the time. The challenge is that it's starting to feel a bit like an imperative, like be positive or else. And if you have a bad mood or heaven forbid a bad day, then you start feeling like you're a failure. The challenge is that positive thinking doesn't work. It's missing a key element. It's missing the action imperative. Because, you see, it doesn't matter how much you sit in your office or on your couch, visualising, creating positive images in your head about the red Ferrari coming down the driveway. It's not going to happen. You have to do something. And as leaders, I think what we need to do is move beyond positive thinking through the more effective mindset of optimism and end up in the action-oriented, optimising approach that I call the optimism zone. Now, with all those different words, it might be useful for us to opt in and check out what they all uh, stand for and where they, in fact, started. So the basis for all of those words is the Latin, optimus, which means best. From that, we then get optimism, which is the tendency to search out there's your action piece, to search out or look for the best. And then by using that, we can then create the optimal condition, which is the situation that is going to create the best results. Then we cross the line and we move into the verbs, into the action words, and to optimise is to take the steps necessary to create the best possible outcome. And then my favourite, because it's the shortest one, to opt, to consciously choose. And as leaders, I think we need to opt to choose our behaviours and our attitudes to get the maximum results from our opportunities. So let me give you a practical example. A few years ago, when I was finishing my high school certificate and about to come up to exams, well, maybe a few more years than a few years ago, but you get my drift. I was um, described mostly at school as, by my teachers in my reports as bright but lazy. I like to think of myself as highly efficient, but my teachers had a different view. I also had a tendency towards cramming. Have I got any friends in the room? Last minute checking for exams? Yeah, good, thank you. So I've got a few friends in the room, that's great. So the idea of leading up to the exams was not exactly my favourite space. What I really wanted to do was study a little bit more like this. I figured if I could just chill out, soak in some rays, read my books, soak in the information, I'd have no trouble passing my exams. My teachers had a different view. But it's interesting because the Newcastle um, University just in the last year did a study of students and discovered that the most optimistic students actually got worse results than the most pessimistic ones. Because, in fact, their delusion about how little study they could get away with led to them not having great end results. So I decided to test this fine line between optimism and delusion in the weekend prior to my first final year exam. There was a concert on, about an hour and a half away from Melbourne where I live. And it was a full day concert, a little bit like the day on the green kind of feel, only we had some very ordinary bands in the first part of the day and then it got better and better and better and the, um, the, the leading act was Santana, giving away my age again a little bit. <laughs> the leading act was Santana. So a very good friend of mine volunteered to drive me down to, the, to attend the concert and drive me down so that I could study my chemistry books on the way down in the car. I somehow managed to convince my parents that, that this was a good pre-exam stress reliever and so we headed off. So, and I actually did study all the way down. Then we set up our little, our little uh, picnic blanket and I sat on the, the blanket and during all of the pretty ordinary bands in the first half of the day, I studied my chemistry text. 
As the light fell, the chemistry bag went away and we rocked out to the rest of the bands and Santana absolutely rocked the house. Brilliant, brilliant performance. At the end of it, my very generous friend drove me home again. I fell asleep in the passenger seat, which was fantastic. The next day, a little bit more uh, review and revision, a little bit more stress relief, and I sat the exam on the Monday. You'd be delighted to hear that I passed. I actually got a B. My chemistry teacher was furious with me because she was convinced that I was going to fail because I hadn't done enough work. But I'd managed to, managed to optimise my opportunity and get the best possible result from that outcome. So that's me. What does that mean for you? So let's think about your businesses and your teams. And to give you an illustration of that, I'd like to introduce you to my grandson. Isn't he gorgeous? His name's Harrison. And in this photo, he's about five. And at five, Harrison was absolutely clear about what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to be a superhero. He just wasn't quite sure which one yet. So for those of you with eagle eyes, you'll see that he has these Superman pyjamas on, perfect for those early morning rescues. He has the Buzz Lightyear scooter. And what you can't see is he also had Spider-Man gumboots. So he was very clear he had the resources necessary to become a superhero. He just wasn't sure which one. He also, as you would imagine, have had an abundance of optimism and enthusiasm. So what about in your team? Have you got people who have an abundance of optimism and enthusiasm but maybe need some support and some resources? Or do you have some people that need to have their optimism managed so it doesn't slip over into delusion? This photo was taken at a Birdman rally in Melbourne. Now, Birdman rallies are held all over the globe. There's, they're in Japan and in Europe and England and all kinds of places. In Melbourne, where we are today, it's um, held on the Yarra River, where uh, normally totally sane adults leap off a very high jetty, heading, heading for the water, attempting to fly, all in the name of charity. Now, you'd have to agree with me that regardless of how optimistic you are, the likely outcome for this is a watery end. It's interesting to note, though, that the research around entrepreneurs wanting to take some leaps into new areas also indicates that optimism can be dangerous. Entrepreneurs generally have a high likelihood to have optimistic characteristics, and I'm sure there's a lot of them in the room. The challenge is that overly optimistic entrepreneurs, worse if they've been successful before, tend to have a negative correlation between their business performance. So the more optimistic you are, as an entrepreneur, the less likely you are to succeed because you might get deluded about the checks and balances that you need to put in place. Interesting to keep in mind. What we need to do as leaders is make sure that our teams are prepared, that we and our teams, if we're about to leap out into the beyond, head off a cliff outside our comfort zone, that we've done the checks and balances, that we've done what we need to do to be really, truly prepared. And that regardless of the industry we're in, we need to make sure that we are taking action on the elements that are going to drive our success. Because false positives can lead to really dangerous outcomes. And it's particularly true in the finance industry. So baby steps are really important, but just positive thinking is not going to get you a house. If you're in the finance industry and you want to target your audience, you need to target the, the people who have done the homework, they've done the research, they know where they need to build, they've done the or buy, they've done the budgeting, all of those elements are covered. And then you can target those people to get the best bang for your buck in terms of the action that you take. What you need to avoid is that fine line with delusion again. And this is what caused us some grief recently when, um, in America, some of the banks started making what they called, ended up calling ninja loans. That didn't mean they, they loaned money to martial arts gurus. It meant that they were loaning money to buy houses to no income, no jobs, no assets, no real likelihood of being able to repay anything. But it was a boom economy and the real estate market was doing great, so it's all going to be fine. Except it wasn't. These people defaulted in droves and as a result we went down the slippery slope that ended up in the global financial crisis for some of whom we're still recovering. So choose carefully about how optimistic you are and make sure that you're doing some balancing. As leaders, what I think we need to do is do some um, adjustments to the way we view some of our opportunities. We need to use some different lenses. And there are a couple that I just wanted to share with you today. The first is around focal distance. Now, the photographers in the room will know that if you change the focal length, you can get a completely different shot. It's the same when you're looking at an opportunity. 
So some people are really good at the lens that is all about detail. They're really good at the focusing on the small, itty-bitty little things that need to get done. They need helicopter pilots around them sometimes to pull them up so that they can actually look around and see where they are. The other lens is the big picture lens, where you're able to see all of the vision of the future, but you maybe need some completers around to fix up the details and tidy things up. So have a think about your preference. What's your bias? And regardless of which one is your preference, do you have people around you who can do the opposite? The second set of lenses that I want to share with you today is a timeline lens. So some tasks have to be done now. Sometimes we need to make sure that we're looking at today, then tomorrow, then the next day, and really just doing what needs to be done next. For some people, that's their natural preference. For others, they're wanting to build for the future. Not castles in the sky, but a strong foundation for future success. And so that's the, set, the other possibility in terms of a bias. So a second question. What's your preference? Which lens do you tend to look at the world through? The today, tomorrow, the next day? Or the tomorrow and across the hills and far away? Make sure that you know your bias and that you have some people around who can help you out. So in case you need more convincing... Let's have a look at some more stats. We're all in the game of selling, I think you'd agree. We're all selling something. And the studies tell us that optimists outsell pessimists by about 30%, regardless of industry, whether you're in services, products, anything. That kind of ratio applies. Interestingly, um, the, the other two parts that are interesting, one is that the top 10% of optimists outsell the bottom 10% by 88%. So you definitely want to start thinking about selecting for and grooming for an optimistic approach if you want to get better results. If you're in real estate, you want to pay particular attention to this because the results suggest that in real estate, optimists outsell pessimists by 300%. That's a really big difference. Now, the other thing to be careful of is that not every industry requires optimists. So if you are in uh, law, uh, medicine or risk assessment, you might need some appropriate levels of pessimism if you don't want your whole business to go down the gurgler. And if you're in uh, customer service or hospitality, the research suggests that the best customer service reps are 50% more likely to be optimists um, and have that approach. They bring in more repeat business and therefore more profitability into their businesses. So let's have a think about this in terms of what we need to look at for um, the outcome for us across the board in terms of maximising our opportunities. So we're coming out of a space that I like to call the Olympic days. That's D-A-Z-E. If you're anything like me and you've spent a hell of a lot of time in front of the television in recent times watching all kinds of fantastic events uh, in the Summer Olympics. But I want to take you back a few years. Do uh, you remember this image of the Jamaican bobsled team? I think most people remember this image. I'm not, I'm not sure whether you know the backstory though. So it was mid-1980s and two American businessmen were in Jamaica and they noticed a couple of things that they decided to put together to create this amazing opportunity. The first was that they noticed an incredible abundance of athleticism amongst the Jamaican uh, people. And then they went to a pushcart derby, a race in a local shopping centre, and made the logical conclusion, fantastic athletes, Push carts, what we need is a Jamaican bobsled team, of course. Interesting decision. The development required more than optimism. It required reality checks. It required some work around uh, systems and processes and measures. And they really had to put together a system to bring this into fruition. 1988, the first Jamaican bobsled team went to the Winter Olympics. The two-man team came 39th. Pretty good effort for a first time. The four-man team crashed out completely. You can imagine people going, see, I told you so, you should never have a Jamaican bobsled team. But they, they stuck at it. They kept working. The next Winter Olympics, all, they had three teams and all three teams finished. In uh, the late 90s, their four-man team did their best ever result of 10, which is pretty creditable for that kind of country. And then in 2002, in their best result ever, they got an Olympic record, not for finishing, but they did break the Olympic start record 
pretty impressive for a country that doesn't even have snow. So as a leadership team, what we need to be thinking about is we need to make sure that our teams are not deluded about their opportunity nor about the result that they're going to get. Some research earlier this year, the Lancaster Management Institute looked at what were the elements that caused business failures both before and during the GFC. And they discovered that blind optimism was one of the danger factors. It led to false positives and a lack of critical thinking. So as leaders, we need to encourage analysis. We need to allow and encourage questions. And we need to apply what Fredrickson and Lasada have called the optimum or ideal optimism ratio, which turns out to be about three to one. What does that mean in practical terms? It means about 25% of the time, if you're really optimistic about an outcome, it might be worth having a bit of a reality check, making sure that you're not popping over that fine line. And so to tap into our Olympics just, of just recently, the, an idea of taking a team and maximising the opportunity would be the 200 metres men's sprint final. The Jamaican trifecta. First, second, third. Bolt, Blake and Weir. What you might not know about these three young men is that they train together. So they have actually taken the, that athleticism that the Jamaican bobsled team guys noticed all those years ago and brought it together so that they can maximise the opportunity. The fact that they work together lifts the standards of the whole team. And they work on their weaknesses just as much as their strengths. Usain Bolt has one of the slowest starts in sprint history, but boy, oh boy, does he have a fast finish. And so the Jamaican trifecta, these three young men with their success at the Olympics, was a classic example of maximising an opportunity. So the results are in. You can choose to optimise your opportunities. And as optimists, you get more. You get more sales, more business, more profit. You get more health, more wealth, more happiness. In fact, you might say that optimists get more everything. The only question is, what do you want more of? Thank you.